Now, yesterday, South Africa celebrated 28 years since the transition from apartheid to democracy under the theme, Consolidate Our Democratic Gains. Now, to speak about these democratic gains and the work that's gone into the liberation of this country, we're joined by Justice Johan van der Westesen. He was director at the University of Pretoria's Center for Human Rights from 1986 to 1998. He's also a former judge of the Constitutional Court, a former Constitutional Court Justice here in this country. And we're grateful for your time and patience this afternoon, Justice. Let's begin first with that theme, consolidating our democratic gains. When you look back from that first day when millions of black people were able to vote for the first time in South Africa, how much has been gained? There is no doubt that we are, as a country, in a much better place than we were in 1994. Um, there is also no doubt that we are in a much better place than we would have been um, or could have been if 1994 did not happen. However, on the third comparison, we are not doing so well, and that is comparing where we are with where we could have been and should have been after 28 years of democracy. But uh, to be fair, I have a positive as well as a more negative view, and I hope there is opportunity for both, mm. uh, time for both. Firstly, from a human rights perspective, on the civil and political rights front, we have been doing very fine, better than many countries in the world. We have free expression and free political activity. Um, uh, we have independent courts. Uh, we have regular elections, for example. One qualification here is on the level of the independent courts. Yes, our courts are independent, but our prosecuting service, prosecuting authority is in bad shape. And so do the police seem to be. We have just heard it from the minister. Um, but with those exceptions, I think we have done very well on civil and political rights. Mm. So However, if we come to the socio-economic rights, and there was a big debate at the time whether they should be included, the rights to water, housing, education, health care. Um, the fear, indeed, was that if one includes these rights in the Constitution and they are not fulfilled or achieved, that it would discredit all the other rights in the Constitution. And there we are not in good shape at all. Um, the President yesterday said that 81% of people have formal housing, if that is correct, and I hear some people dispute it, but that would mean that about 12 million people do not have formal housing. We know that um, many people do not have water and electricity. We know that uh, health services and education, these things are not in good shape. And we know that service delivery on many levels um, leaves much to be desired. Um, so on the level of socioeconomic rights, we have been doing quite right. badly, uh, disappointingly after almost three decades of uh, democracy. Where is the fault? Whose fault is it? I am not a politician, so I do not specifically um, uh, accuse the ANC or the government. Obviously, corruption has a lot to do with the fact that we could not achieve our democratic goals. All right. Uh, Justice, pardon me. I'd like to come in just on the point you were making about the Constitution, what was included and what was not. Was yeah. it always meant to be a sort of finite document? Because when you look at the challenges, as you say, even then, there was clearly a perspective that understood that many of our challenges would indeed evolve or persist. Our cons constitutions over the, over the centuries, actually, from the American one and over decades, have become more and more detailed. Um, in our case, the political and understandable feeling at the time was that it would help little to include all the civil and political rights, but not the socio-economic rights. And the example I often use is that the mama in the far north of Bampopo, who has to carry water and firewood on her head, has little interest in free speech in the state theater of, of, in Pretoria. What she needs are, is housing, etc. 
the danger of those rights is always that what if nothing happens? And at the moment, you know, like I said, I don't want to accuse the government specifically, but what I can say, it is not the fault of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. In fact, there are clauses in the Constitution which have simply not been used. Uh, and I will write next week for my land guardian about it. But Section 184.3, for example, sorry to be technical, but that requires the Human Rights Commission on an annual basis to monitor the different organs of state, the government departments, to monitor how what they have done to achieve socio-economic rights. Mm -hmm. That is a constitutional imperative, and that has simply not happened. Uh, I understand that it happened for a few years, and then several things collapsed, collapsed, and government departments were reluctant. And at the moment, that whole mechanism is not used at all. So. The problem is not the Constitution. The problem is the way that we have been implementing it. Our Constitution has often been described as transformative. That doesn't mean only transform from white to black or, or something like that. It meant also transformed from a very divided society to, a, to, a, to equality, so to an egalitarian society. But in terms of human rights, according to human to organizations, international mm. organizations, we are, according to some, the most unequal country wealth-wise, the most unequal country in the world at the moment. On that point then, some have brought that down to an over-negotiation or an under-negotiation by the ANC for the benefit of the majority black population in this country. Did the ANC come out of that process with a raw deal? Because you were also quite active in the space at the time, looking at what was going on legally. No, I, I don't think so. Uh, you know, the, the Constitution was obviously a compromise in some ways, uh, not in every way. I don't think uh, respecting or guaranteeing the right to life and the right to human dignity is a compromise. I am not sure a compromise between what and what people who respect life and others who don't. Um, the only places where the compromise might have, um, might have taken place is around the property clause. By the way, our constitution does not guarantee the right to property. It has a very long and quite complicated property clause. Um, the ANC at the time at some point argued that there should be no property clause and that property should be left to later um, legislation. The National Party at the time dug their heels in. However, even the property clause as it is could have been used far, to a far greater extent to redistribute land. Um, it is not because the Constitution has been blocking the redistribution of land. So personally, I don't agree with the, that black people or that the ANC came out of it. The ANC were by far the strongest. And um, on my own personal collection, if anybody uh, actually to some extent surrendered, and I'm actually thinking of specific senior individuals in the parties, if anybody surrendered at the time, it was actually the National Party. Um, Mr. de Klerk was busy with his own uh, personal life. Uh, the leader of the National Party negotiating team later become or tried to become an ANC member. Um, the ANC did their homework a lot better than the National Party. But the, the issue then becomes what the ANC did then with its upper hand. I think what the ANC got was, was, was quite good. I, I think if they've just been using it in the meantime, um, if they've, like I just said, there is a clause, by the way, on which this, this clause 185, 184.3, um, some of the ANC negotiators were very reluctant to include a clause that the human rights could monitor their performance on the socio-economic rights level. And they said, one individual said, because opposition parties and NGOs may in future use it to embarrass mm -hmm. them. Now, of course, those words have become prophetic. Um, the Human Rights Commission, the public protector, not, not the present one, which, which, which is, uh, the present incumbent is uh, quite disastrous, but the office of the public protector, the Human Rights Commission, even the courts, 
are often used by opposition parties to embarrass the governing party. That happens in every country, especially countries where there is very little change of uh, very little opportunity, very little chance, actually, very okay. little chance of changing government through the ballot box. Uh, then um, the Chapter 9 institutions and the courts are often used to embarrass the governing party, but their reluctance at the time showed that they were hesitant to actually build in a mechanism to check up on the housing programs, uh, medical assistance, uh, education, water, etc. That may show that there was some kind of a realization that these things could not be achieved overnight, wow. yet these rights were included to give legitimacy to the Constitution. My big fear, if I may say this one sentence, then you Very quickly, I don't please, sir. But my big fear is if clauses regarding socioeconomic rights, like the one I've mentioned, are being ignored and is never used, could the day come where somebody will say, well, we also do not have money for fair trials anymore? Or, for that matter, we do not have money for elections this year. Uh, we will postpone it indefinitely until the economic situation has improved. That is the danger of having rights that are not being fulfilled. Justice Johan van der Westlesen, thank you for your time. Former Justice of the Constitutional Court, thank you for your time. He's also with the UP Centre for Human Rights.